Uh, I love how Zoom has changed that setting and now you have to hear it all the time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Run It Back, everyone. Depending upon what time of day you are tuning in, I appreciate your viewership and uh, or, or if you're checking it out on a podcast, appreciate you listening. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, this is episode number 58, and I am your host, Menelik Fernandez. Uh, the premise of this show remains the same. Basically, we take teams that have played previously, and we run back their game, so to speak, where we talk about how we've prepared, uh, explore matchups, and explore uh, in-game decisions, what's of value to the coach uh, that was partaking in the game, all that stuff, and just sort of putting on the perspective of Hindsight is 2020 when we look back at it, you know, what what we did, was it correct? Was it not correct? Will we change it? Or were, are we willing to live with it? So a long-winded intro to something you guys have all heard for sure. Uh, today we are exploring, and I'm not going to say the club name properly, please forgive me. BC Nevesis. 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 Nevesis yeah. versus Neptunus. Uh, this game took place January 27th, 2021, so a couple months ago. We're filming in May right now, and we are very fortunate, as we have been with many other episodes, to have a coach from the game joining us. We have David Gale here from Nevesis, uh, and David is somebody that I've grown to really admire uh, over the past year. I've heard him speak many, many times. Dave, please give me a second. Let me attempt to uh, do you some justice with a warm welcome here. Uh, coach Gale spent six months as the head coach at Nevegis. Uh, he was prior to that two and a half years as a head coach at Porsche BBA. Uh, spent one season with the Delaware 87ers in the G League. Two years with the Raptors 905 as an assistant coach. Uh, overlapping that two years, five years as a video coordinator with the 905. Uh, prior to that, he spent four and a half years as a video coordinator with the Clippers and four years as a video coordinator for the NBA overall. Uh, he, of course, was also a Division I athlete who played four years and graduated from Loyola Chicago. So uh, as somebody who has been really actively trying to get this gentleman on the show, I am really happy to have you here, Coach Gale. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Run It Back. Thanks. Thanks, man. I, I'm going to correct one thing there. I was not the video coordinator for the 905. I was the video coordinator and player development for the Raptors, not the 905. I'm very sorry about that. Oh, no, you're you. all good. We didn't, ex you. 905 didn't exist. That's the only reason I have to correct that. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I did lift that from your LinkedIn. So yeah. don't hate me. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, now I got to fix my LinkedIn. <laughs> so let, let's, let's get to this game back in January. Uh, you had three days off. Uh, you had played Zalgiris before. You're coming off of a loss. Uh, you know what? Actually, before we even talk about that process, why don't you give me a little bit of background about this league? For anybody who's listening in, tell me a, a bit about Nevejas. Tell me a bit about the league itself, where in the season you were when you're playing this game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for anybody who might not know, like what the league is in terms of uh, level-wise and how they do anything uh, over there. So uh, I was brought in um, the first week in December after they, they made a coaching change. Um, so I came in, uh, we were, I believe this was like the 12th or 13th game in the season and it was my fourth or fifth game. So it was a, it was a tough stretch we were going through because I got there December 6th and by December 7th, we had eight players with COVID. So I flew in and immediately the team had COVID. Uh, and then on December 14th, I believe they told me I had COVID after doing practices with four or five players um, and kind of trying to piece it together as guys came back. I sat in a hotel for two weeks and then they told me I never had COVID. So oh. that was an interesting stretch right there. So I came <laughs> back December 30th, essentially wasted two weeks um, and then we, we basically hit the ground running January 3rd. So I had like, I should have had three weeks of practice. I had four days of practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so we played, it was a very tough stretch. We played um, Ritas, Letkabalis, Zialgiris, like the three top teams in the league, and then Neptunas. So um, 
I was trying to piece together my offense, figure out the players, learn the, learn everything. Um, I think one thing that I didn't realize was how tough the league was. It's a, it's a top 10 league um, in Europe. You know, I think it's about number 10 if you go down the list. Right. Uh, we, you know, there's, it's a little bit more old school, which again was, I was learning that at the time of this game was coming from Germany. Germany is a little more Americanized. There's still, you have a bunch of European aspects to the game there, but there's a lot of American players in the league at this point. Right. Um, and in, in the LKL in Lithuania, most teams have one, maybe two Americans. Uh, you know, Ritas, when I got there, they had Maurice Endor, Andrew Galdock, Ryan Boatwright, uh, Zhao Giris has top level guys, Thomas Walkup and, and, you know, Joffrey Laverne and, and some high, high level guys. Uh, Jakubaitis will be in the draft this year, but those are the Euro League and the Champions League teams. And then Lekabalis is Euro Cup. Other than that, most of the teams have one American player uh, right. and a lot of Lithuanians who have been in the league. So they all know the league very, very well. It's a very tactical league, uh, a lot of half court stuff. Uh, they want to take advantage of mismatches, but to the point where it's, I say old school in the sense that the guards don't take advantage of the mismatch. If you get a switch, throw it inside. Right. You know, there's no, like we had an American point guard, Cedric Bearfield, and he would get a switch and have a big, slow Lithuanian guy guarding him. And the, the, our big post player would say, would want the ball inside when you have an American who can pretty much beat any, you know, it's, it's just a different mindset over there. Um, right. So I was trying to learn that on the fly, essentially. Um, some, some older, slower paced guys. So I wouldn't say it's simple basketball at all, but it's more um, old school sets, not, not as um, innovative as maybe you would see in, in Spain or in Germany or in, in um, some of these other top leagues in, in Europe. But that doesn't make it, trust me, I saw that and I thought it was going to be, oh, this is no easy, no problem, right? Uh, and I got there and it was a wake-up call very quickly. Um, and then our club in general, our club is a, uh, <laughs> let me phrase this correctly, it's not owned by, but like kind of a partnership with Wasserman, um, where a lot of Wasserman players are sent to us. So we had, I see. We had two, two guys in the draft this year. Um, you know, Ariel Hukporti and Abram Sanka, Cedric Bearfield and a young American player, EJ Montgomery, a former Kentucky player, former McDonald's All-American, uh, Panos Kalidzakis, who is a very high, highly touted young Greek player. Um, and then we brought a kid in named Imru Duke uh, from Spain who's from Trinidad and Tobago, 6'11", 21 years old. So it was essentially a G League team with like three older Lithuanian players. And I knew that going in. Um, uh, it was just, I thought the talent and the athleticism, I tried to coach it like I like uh, MHP Reason are, are playing, you know, pressure, long length, cause a lot of problems on defense and get out and run the same way we did in Germany. And the melding of the Lithuanians and the, the young athletes was a very tough, tough go around for the first month and a half. Um, it was much more difficult than I anticipated. Right. So I completely understand all that. I think that's a natural segue to the questions that I ask about game preparation. So as I said in the beginning here, you had three days off. You're coming off of a loss against Jalgiris. How do you prepare for this game when do you like I'm gonna layer a complex multi-level question here as I do so often when do you start your scout what goes into the scout how do you deliver your scout mm -hmm. uh and then you know like how many games are you watching do you give you did play this team prior to your arrival uh mm -hmm. coincidentally on my birthday September 28th do you give more weight to that game than you do to you know any of the previous games that you coached uh, you know, take us through the process of everything that goes into the game prep for this game. So, like you said, we had we had three days between games. So I had an assistant coach. Our staff was not very big. Um, it was it was very similar to what the G League was like or the D League, I, I should say, when I first came into it, where you had two assistant coaches, myself, 
a physio and a strength coach. And like, that's pretty much, and a, and a team manager. Um, you know, there's no, it's not a big staff. So I had one assistant who basically did all the video. Uh, right. I, I did a lot of the video on my own when I first got there as well. I should say, watched it and clipped the things that I thought were important because it was mid season. So I was still teaching my assistant what I wanted, you know, um, and having been a former video guy, it's something I had to get used to not doing myself all the time. Right. Um, you know, so we played Jalgiris and I wanted the breakdown of Neptunas the next morning when I got in. Um, so we would, I, I think if I'm rem remembering correctly and I can pull it up here on my calendar, we practiced that evening. Um, sorry, we came in that morning and watched the film of Jalgiris just to learn because this is the beginning of my, my time in, in Lithuania. So I'm still teaching the players what's right. Well, I didn't have training camp and, and exhibition games right. and all that. So we came in, we watched Jalgiris film. We got some shots up, let the guys go home and come back later at night. And it was, it was a lighter practice because the games were jammed in there. Um, we had a stretch of 11 games in, I believe, a five and a half week span, which, uh, you know, everyone who, who coaches in Europe knows that's not typical unless you're a Euro League or a Euro Cup or a Champions League team. So uh, we, would, we would watch the film as a staff um, try and figure out the, the key sets, right? The key players and figure out to me, the way I like to do it is, is find trends. You know, um, I think it's more of maybe the American side or the NBA side, um, of where I'm coming from with that, uh, is find the trends in their offense. Like, do they run a lot of pin downs? Are they running a lot of angle pick and rolls or is it more mid pick and rolls? Are they posting up a lot? Like, how are they getting into their sets? Because when you have that short period, I would like to know how can we just simplify it instead of walking through five plays and being very specific about this play, we're doing this, this play, we're doing this. I want to simplify it for the guys. So how are we regarding pin downs? How are we regarding pick and rolls? Um, how are we regarding in the post? And if we can simplify that stuff based on what they do, um, that's that I think will help the guys a lot, which is essentially what we did for the first month I was there. Um, so we were doing what, you know, we man, like we've talked about this. You've heard me talk about it. We were doing what we did with the 905 and what I did in Germany. We were sending everything left. Right. Um, and when we watched the film, you'll see we had to make an adjustment because it was a lefty point guard. Um, and all he could do was go left and he couldn't shoot. So we made adjustments <laughs> in this game. So it was, um, I tried to basically spend like the first month. I knew the games weren't the most important thing. Um, and so I was trying to really jam that philosophy into the guys. Uh, and so we would come in and I, I, the first day was just us. That first practice was, was going through Jalgiris, watching the film on Neptunus, but really going through our stuff. Cause we were still learning what I wanted to run and how I wanted to guard and drilling it in shell and multiple action drills and getting up and down the court and working on our press. So that would have been three days out, two days sure. out. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Let, let, no, I was just going to say, let me jump in. Cause I love that stuff. And, and you mentioned you're doing some on court stuff with the preparation at this point, are you doing anything that's like a paper copy that's giving them matchups or, or trends uh, that you're delivering, or is it all just basically you're still walking through the concepts on the floor and you're you're delivering some video to the guys? Um, so for the opposing team stuff, I'm really I, I still believe in giving them giving them the papers, like scouting reports. I mean, not not the drawings. Like I don't think players really understand looking at diagrams. Right. Um, so I've really dived into how do guys learn um I'm, I'm reading about it i'm learning about it um you know getting them in their flow state of mind um right. the play mindset like getting them uh having a good time at the beginning of practice so they're more open to learning and and you know it's it's like teaching kids in kindergarten or or like it's play mindset so you have to get them in this i this state of mind where they're playing like a kid and they retain the information much better. I love um, it. Coach. So I love it. 
uh, you know, the <laughs> pandemic, we've, we've all had time to dive into different stuff. So for sure. Uh, um, to me, like my assistant convinced me not to give paper in Lithuania. And I, I wish I hadn't listened to him because I still believe even if one guy gets something from it, it you've done your job. Um, everybody learns differently. Right. So even when we were in the D league or in the NBA, some guys read it, some guys didn't read it. Um, you know, I still remember, uh, you know, Jose Calderon, Jose Calderon would come to me and, uh, and point out spelling mistakes. So I knew he was reading it. Um, you know, <laughs> right, here's a, a fun fact. That's a total aside because for some reason in this episode, my birthday keeps coming up. Jose Calderon, also born September 28th. He and I are the exact same age. So the day that he uh, stopped playing, I was like, that's it. It's officially over now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Jose was the man. I love that guy. Um, 90, 50, 40. It happened. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we would, I, at this point, we weren't handing out paperwork. It was much more on the court and film sessions and taking guys individually to watch film. Right. To try and, to try and get, get these ideas and be more hands-on and make them kind of feel like they all had a, a specific place in the offense and, and in the defense. And um, I really believe, uh, based on some of my experience with different coaches, with the younger players, you have to be on the court. Like the video does something and the paperwork does something, but for them, they have to be on the court learning it. Um, it can't, it can't be talking with the younger guys. So can I ask you to elaborate a little bit on this too? So you'll pull a guy, let's say you're like, Hey, mental come with me. I got some clips you need to watch. So we'll yeah. go through what five clips, two minutes worth, something like that. And I, then I, you'll I go and try and put me in the actions on the floor. So as we get more comfortable with each other, yeah, we'll, we'll trim it down. Um, I think as a team, it was much shorter film sessions because I know as a right. group, you get guys just staring at the ceiling and um, which was another thing I had to convince the, the Lithuanian coaches. We can't show eight clips in personnel of every player. It's just, you know, can't do it. Like you just have to give them the gist of it and we have to know. And so they know on the court for the most part, but we have to kind of help them through it. That's just the way it goes when you're playing two, three games a week. Um, right. So the individual stuff would be longer. Sometimes, 15, 20 clips, you know, okay. especially when I first got there, because I was trying to really get them to understand what I wanted from them. Now, in a normal year with training camp and all that, yeah, eight clips, 10 clips, you know, but uh, in this season where I came in in the middle, it was, there was no real uh, process for how long each individual film session was it could be you know if you had a good game I just hit a couple of things if it was a different kind of thing and you really needed some work and you weren't getting what we were trying to do maybe it was 25 clips I don't know but I had to take advantage of every minute I had coming in in the middle of the season you know I hear you so in an ideal world would you start with more and then proceed to less throughout the season in terms of clips on the individual side. That's what it would Absolutely. be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Usually it would just be pregame. Like we would do um, 20, each guy would have 20 minutes where they did five minutes with the physio before the game, 15 minutes on, sorry, 25 minutes, five minutes with the physio, five minutes ball handling, 15 on the court. And we would kind of overlap that. So there was never a dead period. Right. Um, and then during as soon as they came off the court, we would watch film for five minutes. And that, that would be the normal flow of the individual film. Um, but again, it was not a normal year. So let's move into a little bit of game strategy type stuff. So, I mean, I don't know how deep you like to go on your bench, but in terms of the preparation, is everybody getting the same amount or are your first eight, let's say, getting more stuff than your last four uh, are getting so to speak, uh, for preparation? And do you deliver matchups to your first five or do you give them to the whole team and everybody's expected to know everything? Um, so uh, uh, Enrico, Enrico will know this a little bit because um, I try to coach the same way I coached in Germany and go, go deep in my bench. Um, and because of the style we were trying to play, 
So right. we were trying to play up-tempo pressure. I told the guys before when I first got there, you know, we're going to uh, – you're going to get your minutes. It might be shorter stints on the court, but you'll get – like the, the top guys will get the minutes they, they get, and, every you know, it'll, it'll flow correctly. Um, but, you know, it's uh, – it's not the same for everyone. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I, uh, no, I forgot no, my power good. cord at home, and I just got it brought to me right now. So um, No problem. <laughs> so I was going deeper. I was going 11, 11 guys. I mean, I, I was playing 10 guys in the first quarter. That was, wow. that was really what we were trying to do. So it was a different style. Um, I kind of learned it from John Patrick in Germany, and I loved it when I was there because we had a loaded – our team was just so stacked. So um, – in order to pick up and play the way we wanted and play at the pace we wanted, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to give everything every second you're there. So we're jumping on you from the start. Um, so we're picking up full court. We're playing run and jump in the half court. We're really loading up and being high at the nail or high at the three point line. Really like our nail is the three point line and wow. our, our low man is the, is the top of the circle, the charge circle. So you're susceptible to back doors and things like that. But if you're playing with your arms out and aggressive, it takes some of that away. Um, teams figure it out eventually and you adjust. But so with our up-tempo style, um, we were playing 10, 11 guys. And, and I'll tell you this, the ownership group uh, didn't understand what I was doing. And this is another learning experience for me to, to go through these things with the owners before before we, you really start into the games. And if you have a preseason, you can do that. If you're just jumping in in December, it's a lot harder. Right. Um, but they, they were coming to me after games. You're subbing too quickly. You're, you know, you're, no one's getting a flow. And I, that's, that's what you hired me to do. That's what I told you I was going to do before I right. got here. So right. um, that was our style. So in terms of the matchups, we would go through the top players, uh, top eight to nine guys in film. And I would go through individually or my assistant, we would talk about what the matchups were going to be with each guy. So we would give each guy like their top assignment, essentially the starters, maybe six, seven, those guys. And then the eight, nine, 10, they just have to know their, um, their tendencies and what, like, are they shooters? Are they drivers? What hand do they use? Um, right. The top guys, kind of everybody, everybody would know when the starters, you would hit on them a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent just because of what you said right now, but uh, how well did players adapt to what you wanted to deliver? Because, I mean, uh, you know, I think most people who watch or listen to the show know I'm Canadian, but in Canada, like, everybody wants to play run and jump. They, they, we, we want to go deep on the bench. We, we want to trap. We want to play full court pressure. We want to bother people, all that. So we're used to it culturally, at least in Toronto. I mean, other parts of the country are a little bit different. So at the pro level, I've heard oftentimes that can be not well received and, mm -hmm. you know, ownership is one thing, but how do you feel uh, your guys adapted to it? And, you know, what was the feedback like throughout the, the season with it? So uh, the young guys, I, I was really lucky to have Ariel there with me because he came from Germany. So he right. already knew the whole system um, and the young guys were no problem. Like really the young players were all for it. The older guys, it took a little more talking to and convincing, but luckily the captain who was the oldest guy on the team bought into it. And we had to get rid of one player who didn't want to play that way. And the ownership gave me the ability to do that. We also right. were able to get some good money for him. So it made right. sense across the board. Um, but to me, the hardest part of it is getting them to do it in practice. Cause you know, we've all heard it older coaches say younger, whatever, like everyone wants to play fast, but no one wants to do what it takes to play fast. Right. Right. So to me, the biggest part of it is building the culture in your practice settings uh, that this is how we're going to play. Like, this is what we're doing. So uh, there's a couple drills that I took from, from Germany with me, um, a four on four on four drill where it's four on four in the half court. As soon as the offense crosses half court, that defense who's waiting picks them up. They have to give them like two steps across half court. But the pressure, you can go all out because you're not guarding them on the other side. Right. And they can't just throw it long. 
So it's it, like you're, you're creating this havoc a little bit. And we would do a two-on-two press, a three-on-three, a four-on-four and build up to it. Um, we did a lot of fast break transition spacing drills, a lot of uh, get back drills out of the press. So to me, you're building that in practice and you can kind of see who's buying in and who's not. Um, I would say they didn't believe in it. And this is typical. They didn't believe in it until it worked in a game. So we played a team called Zukia, who's an older team. And we started pressing and it was kind of, they were half in, half out. And we were getting beat on long balls. We were getting beat out of the trap because they weren't taking away the next pass. And the fourth guy wasn't up taking away the half court pass. And right. so finally they went, they, they, they sold out. And they, we got like three steals down the stretch. And we ended up losing by one or two, but we only, it was an eight point game or a 10 point game. And we got back in it because they sold out. And so when you get those examples, you can make the point to them, look, this is how it works. You have to be all in. If you're not all in, it's not going to work. Right. Um, Middle to the metal, I agree. Yeah, and you're going to have to chase guys down from behind and hope they miss transition shots. Um, so it took a little bit of time, but it was, you know, like I said, to me, the biggest part is building the culture of that, of your, your work ethic, um, your, your all-out defense, your all-out offense. That you just have to give 100%, and then you convince them, you give me that. I'll get you your quick breather. You're going to go back in the game. Your minutes are going to be the same. Your runs are just going to be a little bit shorter. Right. Uh, there's a question that went in the chat. It's from Chris Bogart. Chris is at Western on the women's side here in Canada. He said, I've heard some discussion on this before, having to deal with owners versus the GM. Uh, do the owners have a basketball background where you were at? They do not. Um, they do not. And it was, a, it was an interesting setup there. Um, the owners purchased the team two years ago. The team was extremely in debt and they're still paying off the debt from the last owners from like eight years ago. Right. So they're trying to do that. And then this year trying to get involved on the basketball side. And then we had a sport director who's a former agent. I believe he's 60. So he's been around it a long time, but he's an older mindset. And then it was, a, it was an interesting mix. And then you had myself and one of my assistants was Bobby Gonzalez, um, who coached at Seton Hall, uh, you, you know, a decade ago. Um, but his style was similar to my style. So they, call, they kept saying it's American style basketball. I said, hey man, look, I took this from Germany. So it's not American style basketball. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but Canada. they try and, you know, <laughs> it was a cultural thing the whole time I was there. For sure. Like the referees would say to me, you know, no, this is how we do it in Europe. I know this is how we do it. Like I've been here for three years now, man. Like, you don't, you know, so it was, it was an interesting experience, but uh, the one thing I'll say, Lithuanians know their basketball very, very well, but they all think they invented the game as well. Interesting. Uh, all right. So what did you like going from sort of the general process of how you, deliver info to your guys and what you do with your coaches and all that moving into the a specific game what did you if you can remember what did you identify as weaknesses on the other team that you wanted to attack yeah and then what did you identify as your strengths that you wanted to really like you know we want to put our foot down and stamp our our point of view on this and from both of those things in hindsight how well do you think you did in terms of executing from what you identified? So they played an interesting defense. They were uh, the, uh, when it was, the ball was going at the two side, they would always pull in the low man. Like, and when I say, sorry, going out or going away from the two side, it didn't matter. They would always pull in the low man on the two side, like under the rim. And the guy guarding the guy at the 45 would drop and play two. But he didn't do a great job of playing two. And right. you could see that on film. So we were trying to flare on the weak side every single time. Like nail that 45 guy, flare our 45 guy to the corner, and then either pop out to the 45 or slip to the rim. Because they were so far pulled in, we knew the kickouts were going to be wide open the whole game. Right. Um, and then once they start adjusting to that, now they're not taking away the roll at all. Like at all. Because they start both going out, and now our roll man's wide open at the rim. So that was – offensively that was the game plan so would you then in these three days 
reinforce that by going through three on three, four on four, five on five, whatever type live actions where you're like, you're just constantly like, we want to flare this guy. We want to flare yeah. this guy. You're like hit him, hit him, hit him. Like just over constantly. and over and over. Look, Hey, the kickouts are there. The kickouts are there. Look at the weak side corner. The kickouts are going to be there. You just, whatever you say, I really truly believe this. Like whatever you're statting on the bench, whatever you talk about consistently, that's what the players like if you if you drill this in, that's all they're hearing. They're gonna focus on it. I know we like to say players don't listen or or players do what you know. Sometimes they do what they want to do. Whatever. I truly believe whatever you say is important. Like if you hit one, two, three things, they're gonna hear that. They might not hear anything else, right. but they're gonna hear the things that you keep drilling in their head. You are what you reinforce. I've heard this many many times, right? Exactly. Sure. So the second part of that is. We have, um, we have movement drills that I've been doing since 905. Um, that's that actually since, since before that, since um, really when Nick got to the Raptors as an assistant coach, we started doing these movement offensive drills, drive, kick, swing stuff. You know, right. his five outs spacing, drive, kick, swing. And then we tweaked them a little bit with Stackhouse. And then I tweaked them a little bit more when I got to Germany, but it's, what movements do you want, right? And this was really hard for the Lithuanian guys because they want to say, well, if they're guarding us this way, we have this movement on the pick and roll. If it's th if they're hedging, we have to do this. If they're, and I, I understand that completely and I learned a lot from that. But my thing was, if the ball is going away from you, like a mid pick and roll, if the ball is going away from the two side, we're going to flare and look at the hammer. If the ball is coming at the two side, we're going to 45 cut lift and get back out to the corner. Okay. And like, that's the movement I wanted. And it was really tough for these guys. It's like, well, he's hedging. So wouldn't I want to be there as the release pass? I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to have the, we're going to have him short roll and he's the release pass short or the reverse pivot guy. and hit the guy lifted behind you. And so that was another thing that was very difficult for these guys who are so, well, this happens, this happens, then this happens in a different way. Right. So um, our movement, we would drill these movements, drive, kick, swing. I'm driving in the outside flare, hit the corner, swing it. Right. That was what we drilled the whole week going into this game. We uh, the stereotype is, too, that in North America, not just the United States, but in North America, we have more dynamic ball handlers who want to yes. dribble more. So a lot of the time, like you say, you know, in terms of being mechanical and making the, the right contextual play. Mm -hmm. We don't drill that the same way in North America, but a lot of our guys are creative and are able to find ways to work around things because they're so good with the ball. Right. Right. So I had Cedric Bearfield who could pretty much get around almost any pick and roll coverage in Lithuania. Right. Except the hedge. And when teams realized he couldn't get a car, he, he got destroyed in a hedge. They just started hedging him every single time he had the ball in a pick and roll. Um, and one thing I learned, if, if I didn't learn anything else in Lithuania, how to attack a, attack a hard hedge. I mean, these teams were, were crushing us on the hedge. So there were a couple of things we did. We can get into that later, but For there sure. were two main things that we killed Lekopolis against their hedge because they did the same thing every single time, no matter what you did. Interesting. So you mentioned, we talked a little bit about being what you reinforced. Uh, and you during that mentioned you know what you're tracking on the sidelines and all that that's a question i ask all the time on this show what are you paying attention to from the box score what are you paying attention to in terms of having your assistants or somebody stat on the side with you and how do you make in-game adjustments based upon whatever you're looking at right so i mean one of the things we track most most teams track it is deflections right and I like to reward the guys who get for deflection. So we track them individually. And right. I, I, I was doing that on the bench back in 2012 and 2013 with the Raptors. Um, and it was always Kyle Lowry, like, or, or, you know, Terrence Ross always. Right. Um, so, you know, like that one, I don't think it's the most important, but I, you can tell activity from it. You can tell who's active in the game, who's engaged in the game. So, and then I'll keep, I keep an Excel spreadsheet. And I show it to the guys after every game. And there, then you can create a competition 
like there's a reward for whoever finishes with the most deflections at the end of the season. Right. We're tracking it and we're making them aware of it. Um, and we're letting them know at halftime at the end of games and we have a goal. You know, it's 35 deflections every single game, um, which I think is a low number, to be honest, at the pro level. Um, so that's one thing we were tracking and we would let them know throughout the game. Look, you, you're usually getting eight a game. You're at one right now. Like you're, you're not active. You're not engaged on defense. Right. So, um, and, and would that feedback often be enough? Like just, Hey man, do better. Basically like you're, you're not as engaged as usual or whatever. And that's usually enough for these guys to change behavior. You find uh, that because of what, because of the importance I put on it in practice as well. Right. right. So, showing them in front of the whole team okay this is the leader right you're you're the leader so those guys take pride in being the leader uh, in something in something anything it's not right. just points it's not rebounds not it's something that's not in the box score so you know the kid panos kalizakis led us in deflections he was a crazy all over the map defender and everyone would say, well, you can't trust him. I said, yeah, but he's creating turnovers for us. So I agree with you. Certain situations, he can't be in the game. But if we want to play fast and create and force turnovers, he's he's great for us. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly <laughs> the stat you want, right? Like yeah. So there was that. And then we, um, we were tracking, after the game, we were tracking passes per possession which in Europe, it's not something you can easily get. Like in the NBA, you can find it online. And so people are tracking it. Um, because when I got there, the ball wasn't moving. And I, I was just trying to get the ball moving. Um, so uh, we Sorry, I have a very specific question about that. Because when I was at York University, we used to track that as well. Will mm -hmm. you include passes in the backcourt or no? Um, it depends. If we're, being, if we're throwing an early hit ahead, then yes. But if it's breaking a press, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't include that. Okay. Um, Sorry to interrupt you there. No, 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 no. Uh, that was really more to change the culture, because, like I said, when I got there, it was slow. Bring it up the court, run a zipper, throw it in the post. Nobody moves. Everybody stands and watches. Um, so I was trying to get the mindset to change of moving the basketball around. Um, the other thing uh, we started to track at the end of the season was early throw aheads. Uh, and that's one, you know, that's one that I kind of got, I was watching a G league game and I think it was Santa Cruz and they were talking about how they track those. And so I messaged my guys in golden state that I know very well and asked them and what their number was. And um, so to me, if you want to play fast, you have to throw the ball up the court. And like we talked about reinforcement, right? We're, if we want them to do it, we have to track it and show them. You can't just say it. You have to show them how much they're doing it. Right. Um, so that one to me is something going forward that I will 100% track. I know Cody, Cody Toppert's talked about it a lot as well. Um, early pitch aheads, early throw aheads, whatever they, ETAs, I think they call it. So, right. Um, and then the last one is paint touches um, that we would track. So the two, I mean, deflections and paint touches were the two I would focus on the most because we were trying to collapse the defense and kick out, especially in this Neptunus game. Uh, you know, we wanted to get the collapse the defense, maybe hit the short roll guy, kick it to the corner on that flare screen. We were looking for those kickouts. So this game, the paint touches were extremely important to, to make the defense collapse, expand, collapse, expand, right. To create those driving lanes. So if you would get three paint touches on one possession, would you count them as three paint touches? Or yes. would it, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and even offensive rebounds, a lot of times I was counting as a, as a paint touch. Um, just again, at this point, it was really to reinforce that we wanted the ball in there. So if we threw it in the post and he got two feet in the paint, that's a paint touch. So would there also be a point, let's say you're halfway through the first quarter. A lot of the time I like to ask the question, like, what are you, what are you looking at at halftime? What's the little speech that you're giving? But you know, let's say you're halfway through the first quarter and you have whomever taking care of the metric of paint touches and you're at two paint touches. Will you start running certain plays that you know will get you more paint touches or will you just talk to certain people like, hey, you're usually around here. I need you to be more assertive and get in the paint type deal. A little bit of both, a little bit of both. Um, I have a card with me. Again, um, this is, uh, I got this from Nick. 
uh, when he was an assistant with the Raptors. Uh, he, I believe JAMA does exactly what you're about to describe too. So, so we would, I have a card on, it's on two sides. One side is plays for certain players. And right. the other side is plays to attack certain coverages or to get certain movements. Love it. Um, so one side I will have, I want Cedric, like you said, I want, I need to get in the paint. This is a play for Cedric Bearfield. We're running this because I know he's going to get in the paint on this action. Right. Or I would look and say, okay, what do we have that will move the ball side to side? Because we're just static and it's staying on one side and this will create a drive for us. And I'll run something side to side movement. Um, it's a tinkering. You have to continue to play with that sheet to see how it's easiest for you to look at it very quickly in the game. Right. Um, would and, you say that like every game you're redoing that card? It's like 100%. A, a new cheat sheet for a new test every time? <laughs> every single time I'm redoing that card. Every single time. Especially I'll have a section with ATOs where I know against this team they play this way and this guy's kind of you know in a groove. So we're going to run this ATO because I'll have five ATOs per game that I want to remind myself to run. Right. Um, and sometimes it's just a play that we run that I'll put there, you know, um, or I would go through and shoot around. Here's the first play of the game. Here's an ATO we're going to run today. We'll go through it two or three times. So the guys are, are used to it. And that, that I took from case. And I think most, most coaches do that um, in the NBA where, at, if you're in a hotel ballroom, you'll walk through. Here's the first play of the game tonight. You know, right. The so I love it, and I think that it's a perfect transition for what is my last question before we get into a little bit of film. Uh, and I actually got and have elaborated on this idea from Enrico Kufor, who's in this call. But do you do anything that is like a post-game report that basically ties in? the effectiveness of your pregame report and how well, you know, okay, like, was this correct and mm -hmm. we just didn't execute or did I miss stuff? And for the next game, this, this, and this need to be added in order for us to be successful. I think uh, this post-game report is a great idea. It's definitely something I've pulled from this show. And yeah. Enrico was actually my original guy for that. So, so uh, Jesse Mermis had us start doing it the first year with 905, because it was his first year head coaching. Right. And so he wanted to know what the assistants took away from the game. He was going to watch the film and he was going to do his work, but he wanted to, he wanted like a, a cheat sheet, if you, if you will, if you will. So from the guy doing the offense and the guy doing the defense, he wanted their post game reports. And then Stackhouse came in the next year and I kept doing it because it helped me as a coach. It really helped me to go back through the game and write up my notes because it's like anything else. You're watching the film and you're making your edit, but there's certain things you're not putting in the edit that you right. really want to remember. You want to share with the coach. Um, so you can make a coach's edit that's just for the coaches, but it helped me to type it. So the same would go in, in this setting in Lithuania. I was going through and doing my own pregame notes that I would bring to the coaches meeting. Like I was watching the film. I wasn't preparing it for the team, but I would have my notes. Here's how I want to guard this. Here's the most important player. Um, here's what we need to focus on. And we would share that as the coaching staff. And when we left the coaches meeting, all of us would know what I thought was the most important part of it. And we collaborate right. and all that, but we all had the same idea. And I was continuing to type up during the meetings, right? And then I would go back and watch it. And basically exactly what you said, I would compare with what we wanted to do before the game. I kind of knew already because as the head coach, you have to know. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, write the post game report. And yes, the next time we play them, I would go back and look at the post game report. And so sometimes it was, it was a paragraph. Sometimes it was a page. Uh, I can remember when we played, Maine in the in the Eastern Conference Finals in the D League playoffs with Stackhouse, my, my report to him, the pregame report based on playing them five times that year, and the, you know it was like three and a half pages, and it was we need to hit on this, this, that, you know, like a playoff series is a little different, um, but yes, the the postgame report for me really helps me, um, and I got into this a little bit with the coach who had been there before me, we got to know each other a little and he didn't take notes and he didn't write things down. 
and we would have this whole debate about this. And I, you know, it's it's proven. It's science. If you right. take notes, it's and you do a practice plan and you write your notes after the game, you're gonna remember it better. And it's gonna be what like the, the reinforcement. It's what's most important to you. So it's not how I feel. It's it's proven that ki kids who take notes remember things better. You know, like <laughs> even even if you don't write down, for instance. There's so many options now where like you can voice to text stuff. Yes. Like if, if you use like an Evernote or something like that, and you're just using the voice to text, you don't have to literally type or write down everything, but it's there for you. And I think like, it's definitely something I've picked up from this show. Like I said, kudos to Enrico, but like, uh, it's like, to me, when I go back and I look at some of my notes from old games, I'm like, you know, this would probably be more helpful if I had done this, this, and this. Right. To look at it. Right. So. Yeah, no. And, and um, for the coaches that don't have the ability to use huddle or some sort of video sharing with the players. So I started doing the post game notes. And then because I knew like these quick turnaround games, maybe we couldn't watch the post game. I was, we would create the edit. We put the notes on it we type up the report and we would put it on YouTube on a private channel and then yeah. send the link to the players for the YouTube private channel. And you can see, even on YouTube, you can see how many guys view it. Yeah. And, and even though you tell them that I don't, it was funny. We were playing Juventus and I told the guys, Hey, this is the first time we're going to do this. I really need you to drill in the personnel. You're not picking it up by watching it one day before the game. So we put all the personnel up there sent them all the links and you get like three views on each video. Even though you tell them, you can see. And then you tell them, I told them the next day, hey, I saw, no one even watched it. And then immediately like that night I looked and the offensive clips had 25 views. Yeah. And like, okay, like, it's like, they're like little kids. You have to, you know, sometimes these guys are like little kids. You have to stay on them in that way. But there's it's ways to share, to share the information even if you don't have the, the budget to do it. For sure. I know a coach who does something similar like that with YouTube, but then he makes all of his players comment on the video. So, so it's like, I watched it and at three fifty-five, this happens or, or I like the way that this player does that or something like that. Right, You quiz them on it a little bit, right? Yeah, exactly. So that they have to do anything. If anybody has some questions, please feel free to jump in. If not, I'm going to move into a little bit of film here from this game. Uh, so, uh, David, just as I had said uh, when we were talking before, uh, I'll play everything two to three times. Basically, mm -hmm. first time, just so you can take a look at it. The next time, I'll try my best to describe it for anybody who's listening and not watching type deal. Uh, and then third time, it's all yours. You know, take it away. Tell us what you see. Tell us what you wanted, what you like about it, if you would do anything differently. Sure. Uh, let me just uh, – I'll try this first one. And is that good playback speed wise? It's clear. It's not choppy. All of that. Uh, it's good enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so it's a defending clip. It's the first play of the game uh, for them. Uh, and uh, I'll run this through one time and then I'll try it on the way back. So here we go back to the beginning of this clip. First play of the game, it's an entry to the left offensive left slot. Uh, there's a pin down up top, and then he pops back out in like a shallow cut type motion. Then there's a shuffle cut from the weak side where they bring their post down. I would almost call it a wedge. Uh, they throw it in, and he uh, flips a little hook up, misses the shot. You guys rebound it, and you're out. Do you have the action? Do you feel that you guarded it well? What do you think they're trying to establish? Would you do anything differently? Any of that stuff? Uh, yes. Yeah. So right here, Ariel should be dropping all the way back to deter this pass. So we knew the big, the five man was not a shooter. And so we told Ariel, let him leave him up top. Doesn't matter. Cedric Barefield, right uh, no, um, the center, the, the tall uh, African kid up top. Right here, right here. Yes. So he's supposed to be dropping um, as the guy guarding the our four man with the, the man bun um, is <laughs> supposed to be is supposed to be forcing forcing the four man over the screen. So I would say we didn't guard this well at all. Um, and Cedric Bearfield, the guard, is supposed to bump and and then you know they're 
they're looking inside. They weren't looking for the shooter coming out. We knew that. We knew they were going to try and establish an inside presence right off the bat. So there's not really a bump. And Ariel doesn't do a good job just dropping and deterring this pass. And our four-man gambles. So I would say we really got lucky in this possession. Um, we walked through this play. This was one of the three plays we walked through before. Um, so well, they we went, do get they a good right to it. First, first play of the game, they went right at it. Eh? I, I, and if I remember right, they ran it like two or three times to start the game right off the bat. Yeah. Um, so they were trying the, – the, the foreman that gambles here was our captain. He was leading the league in rebounding. So they were trying to get him in foul trouble early. Um, and I think they didn't really – you know, I'd only coached four games, so they didn't know what to expect because we had kind of changed coverages a couple times already. So in an ideal world, drop the five more, this big gentleman here. And, and yes, because number 21 for Neptunus cannot shoot at all. Right. And then bump the cut and force them over better and then don't gamble at it, basically. Basically. And then you... we do have we do, do a good job of Cedric as our low man. And we wanted, like I said, at this point, I was trying to simplify everything. So the low man was coming over no matter what, no matter who it was, five man, one man, didn't matter. So this is an interesting question that I have then from what you're saying, because uh, I, I've watched a lot of video lately on pick and roll stuff. And one of the things they talk about is putting the five in an overhelp position. Would you say that your five is probably overhelping a bit here then be just from his tendency to want to block shots, et cetera? Yeah, so, yes, I would. Because, like, like, so you see, we have the point guard come. So, really, what the five should be doing is boxing out the guy who's right next to him. And right. instead, he's just kind of in this in-between space. Um, which, they're, they're the biggest guys. They always – they have this tendency to, like, I'm going to go and block that or help out type deal. And then – Yes. So, we had um, – I believe we were still doing it in this game. We were When the ball went in the post, we were dropping into a 2-3 zone. So there was no time to do it here because it was so quick. But I saw um, Gostakiewicz do it at Jalgiris the year before. And obviously during the pandemic, everybody was just watching film. And so I said, in the next job I get, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try it. So we were still doing that. And we were trying to do it with the five man because um, I took the philosophy that nobody's going to hit 23s against us right so no matter where the five was at let's just drop him we'll get into our two three zone and if they get a three we'll contest it but we're, we're going to protect the paint um like it you know so yeah he's over helping but again like i said i would go back and maybe simplify things even more than i did and a training camp would have been great three days of practice before sure. the first game was not ideal <laughs> um all right, so the next one, I believe, is your first half-court set. Uh, and then my note says play after the play stuff because I think your initial action didn't work, and I just kind of wanted to know what you're teaching your guys play after the play and what you think mm -hmm. in terms of how you executed it. So you've got sort of like an Iverson cut to the left slot, and then it's touch action. He gives it right back. Uh, he comes off of a flare. You enter it to the five at the, the top of the key just above the three, the three point line, excuse me. You get a backdoor cut from the 45. Uh, and then we try the handoff action and he backdoors as well. So then we reverse it when we don't have anything. Another 45 cut. And then we end up with a shot from the, the lift uh, to the 45. So talk me through the action. Uh, is this all scripted? Am I correct that we get into some play after the play type stuff? So, yeah, so a hundred percent. So on this handoff here, yeah, the four was supposed to flare. We were going to hit and then the back door and handoff to the guy coming at the point, the combo guard coming out of the corner. Um, so the back door was supposed to be there with number nine. And right. then after this game, we put in a rule. Okay. Number two, come off for the handoff. If you don't get it, your action is either curl around or go set another split screen up top here for the four man. So right. if you don't get the handoff, you either keep curling and look for the late pass or you set another split action with the next guy over. That was our movement play after the play, as you called it. Right. He should not have backdoored here because he leaves our five man in a very difficult position. Um, so 
like you said, okay, REO makes a great play. He swings it. He doesn't get stuck. And then the rule on the, on the weak side, if you have a three-man eye over there, right, the middle guy was always cutting for us. Right. Unless it was a different set. So he cuts, and we're really, like you said, touch action. I didn't want any dribble handoffs. No hand-to-hand -hand action. So it was either um, we were calling it toss game, right? So like you called it touch, it was toss game. So even on the, the DHOs, we were leaving a gap between it for the little toss because I learned this from Brett Brown. He used to call it Noah's because um, Joe Kim Noah used to do it all the time. It creates this confusion. Is it a DHO? Is it a pick and roll? So you're putting the defense in an interesting spot. And the big is you're, you're giving your guard the ability to get it at pace without being muscled up right on the DHO and you're giving your big, the ability to run in and slip out of it rather than hand off set go. So it, it just puts you in this little in between space. Um, I think the team that does the two teams that do it best in the NBA are really Miami um, and, and Indiana. If you watch those two teams, Sabonis is always tossing it rather than hand to hand. Right. Um, now I had a debate with uh, Earl Watson the other day about this. And Earl, Earl hates it. He was like, no, 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 we're going hand to hand. Like guys are going to bust through that. It takes away other action. So I think it's just coach's personal preference, but right. to me it creates a lot of problems for the defense and it gives your offense more space and time to create something. Like um, it. So, so like you said here, yeah, we, we move it rather than dribble handoff. We move it quick as he's running into it, but because of the, the toss, you see the guard doesn't really know, is it going to be a pick and roll coming? Should I get underneath it? Should I close out? He kind of choppy steps in the middle, which opens up a three for one of our better shooters. Love it. That's, a, a, that's an interesting pickup. So I've heard the term pound and pitch before. Mm -hmm. Same kind I would of assume idea. that was exactly the same idea of where you're just kind of flipping it over type deal, and it's not right hand to hand. Uh, I, I feel in my mind that that also allows for your bigs to not pitch it and be able to get through if the coverage is cheating a lot easier. Exactly. So my rule, and I think we've talked about this before, if we went five out, my rule with the guy up top was put the ball on the ground right away. So you can get into that toss or pitch action, or you can keep it in attack, but you're a threat right away. Right. Because – one thing I struggle with is a lot of the time, like bigger guys are not the best dribblers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if you're forcing them to pick it up, like to make that decision and, and literally hand to hand it, if that's that slip dribble, that escape through is there, yeah. you know, you're adding an extra decision that doesn't need to be there sometimes. Like sure. We drilled it. We would play a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of, of our sets with no dribbles in practice. Um, which created the toss action or one dribble or two dribbles we would build up. Um, and so, and then sometimes we would just say, no, you're free, but uh, you have to have five passes this possession, right? So we're drilling that, that concept in different ways where they're getting comfortable with the ball in their hands and not just pounding it, but looking to, to toss it and move it to create the advantage. Right. The next one is just a, a set I liked. I think it was a reject action. So I'll let this play in and play through. You guys come down in transition. Uh, you reverse the ball through. Uh, I'm, I'm incorrect. Sorry, you come down, you fake like you're going to reverse it through. Uh, and then you hit the corner uh, back up to the slot. And now we're onto the reverse, which was going to be a pass and follow. And he rejects and attacks that low man and then gets a little lob for the, the back door in there. So are we playing or is this organized motion? And talk to me about what you see, what you like out of it. Okay, so we wanted we wanted to go into five. We wanted, let me look at this real quick. So EJ Montgomery, number three there, he had just gotten there a couple of days before and was still learning the European sets. And so like your, your classic, like naked corner, Three man right. on the weak side. That's what we were trying to get into. But you see, he goes to the block because he's used to being in Kentucky where they wanted him down low going dunker to dunker. Right. So what it, what it creates here 
is basically our five out action, right? You see number five dive, the ball looks at him. He's either going to come get the hand up or set a pin down. The guy will curl around him, right? Or he's diving. So right. number five dies. And like I told you, so he's not, 88's not open. And like I told you here, if you don't, Cedric Bearfield comes around, if he doesn't get the handoff, you see he puts the fist up, either tight curl or go set another split screen. Right. Which he does, and it creates, he's open on the pop because they deny the other handoff. Right. And then again, like we're just playing really, but we're playing out of the movements we've drilled. Okay, if you don't get the handoff, you go set another split screen. If the ball looks at you, either set a pin down or back door. So what I was really trying to do when I first got there was teach the guys how to play and make reads right. um, without necessarily having to call a play. And I guess that's where they say that's the American or North American style rather than coming down and dictating everything based on how they're guarding you. Um, but based on the personnel I had, 88, 2, 5, and, and Montgomery, number three, who goes up, these guys are athletes. They move well. Like, we don't have to dictate the action with them because they know how to space and read. Right. Um, so, yeah, like you said, we're trying to shift the defense, and this is also when I was really drilling in, move the ball, more passes per possession, keep the defense shifting. So we're playing an older Neptunus team, who wants you to play half court. They don't want to get up and down. They don't want to have to guard different multiple coverages each possession. Um, and because it was a pass and follow there from number 22, after a fake handoff and the ball hopped to the corner and hopped back to him, his man's out of position to ice here. You know, they want to ice, but they're in between. Are we hedging because it's number two or are we icing because it's on the side? Right. right? So that's where that little toss action you know, they would, um, everybody wanted to hedge on number two. Everybody. I'm really not sure what number six is trying to do defensively right now at all. I think he sees number two and he wants to hedge, but the guy guarding him sees it's a side pick and roll. And because number two has already passed it, cut, set a screen, pop back out. Now he thinks, oh, we're just in an ice. Right. So to me, that's what I'm seeing here. And then Cedric makes a great read. And because 88, who had come over and didn't get the handoff that they denied, is so lifted, the low man has to help, and there's no drop on, on Montgomery. Love it. Uh, one, one more question about this. This gentleman here. Yes. Would you consider him just in a shrink, or is he helping ball side to you? And what cues would you give your ball handler in terms of, hey, continue on to the basket or make this pass type deal? Uh, like, what are you teaching him to read? Is it, is it a shoulder? Is it the eyes? Like, what, like, what do you give them? So again, this going into this game, we knew, like I said, we knew they pulled the low man over like extremely far. Right. And then they, they were confused a lot of helping strong side corner or not. So right. we, we already told him going into this game, the strong side corner kickouts will be there. So he already knew coming in that this action was going to be available. Uh, now, to me, the bigger problem is number five is not deep corner. He's too high, right? So even if he makes this kick out, number five in the strong side corner, it should be two steps down. And knowing, I think Cedric knows his teammate, he would have pump fake and take five dribbles and taken us out of all the movement we got anyways right. because of where he's standing. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, we knew coming, coming in, you know, they're going to overhelp on the strong side and they're going to pull in low man. So you see number 88, who was at the 45, as Montgomery dives and Cedric drives, number 88 is sliding corner because we knew pull in, like I said, we wanted to flare, but because this lob is there, we took that. Right. Yeah, but you I mean, can see 88 sprinting corner because Cedric was looking for that weak side kick out. And, and I mean, quite frankly, this low man has, we, we play a lot of this in my conference where the, the low man is right on the rim line type deal. You yep. have no chance against a good leaper. I mean, yeah, good yeah. luck. <laughs> like, that guy's going to put it down on your head. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, you know, that was that was what we knew we wanted. We knew we could get that stuff, penetration, move it, move it, move it, penetrate, look at the kickouts, look at the lob. Love it. Uh, this is an easy one. I ask this every week. Transition threes for you, yay or nay? And if yay, if yes, 
uh, you know, is there criteria that has to be met before they're allowed to shoot them, so to speak? Um, yeah, we went through roles. When I got there, I, I started learning the guys and we went through roles. Um, I, I openly told them, I, I was told that nobody had shared that information. It was just kind of like, hey, this is our offense. Here's how we play. Nobody told anybody what their roles were. Right. And, and I learned that with Vinny, Vinny Del Negro gave out cards. Coach Casey gave out laminated cards. Here's three things that you do. Handed it to the guys. One for you, one for your locker, one for your agent. Wow. So I kind of learned that stuff uh, as a young as a young coach. And then uh, Jamma, who you mentioned already, did some interesting stuff that I didn't have time to put together. But there was the goal to put together a highlight video of their roles to get them to buy in more because they can see. I love it. I, I told you. I've, I've seen a, a few of them, actually. I had the good fortune I, of attending yeah, I, some of their practices and they're great. I love it. I think you get guys really to buy in if you sell them um, by them you know, hyping them up for doing it. So I'm all for transition threes. It was just another debate with my Lithuanian assistant coach about playing fast shots in the first five or six seconds are better shots. The longer the possession goes, the probably the worst shot you're going to get, which they think totally opposite over there. We have to work it. We have to get the best shot. doesn't matter when in the shot clock it is. Right. You know, find the mismatch, get the best shot. So this guy was our highest, uh, I believe he was our best percentage three-point shooter. He led the team in makes makes from three. Um, so this, for me, was a good shot. Now, if you go back to half court, we're definitely not running wide enough, and he needed to get to the corner because he's looking back at the ball the whole time we're running down the court, um, which he was one of those guys who uh, – I love the term. I learned it last summer from Kyle Guy. He was horny for the ball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love it. Uh, he, yeah, you know, I won't say who he said was like that on the Sacramento Kings, but this guy, <laughs> Panos, was horny for the ball. And Cedric, the same. Cedric's not running wide enough. He's not running fast enough. Like, this is our foreman pushing it, which I was good with. You know, all these guys on the court could handle it, so I didn't care who pushed it out. But you had to get wider. And so this was a clip I showed in our post game as well. It's a good shot, but you got to run to the corners. And the example I always use is Terrence Ross. We had to convince him the first year, but his second contract, he got paid $30 million to go run to the corner. Like, <laughs> you can get paid a lot of money to get to the yeah, corners. Like, what are we talking about here? That's that's life-changing money. <laughs> yeah, so to me, the shot's good, especially that guy, but I prefer if they ran wider and harder. Like it. Uh, the next one is a clip of you guys defending. I think it was a series of actions that I like is the note that I made. Uh, I think I like their set overall. Uh, I'll run through it here. Uh, it's an entry to like uh, the left slot just above the three point line. They set what would be a chin screen and then he comes for an angled handoff and attacks from that wide left slot. Uh, turns into basically uh, a handoff into a ball screen. So I guess the equivalent of pistol action coming out of that corner. Uh, and then they roll him on what would be the single side there, but you guys end up getting the steal out of it. So how do you feel you defended everything? Do you have the set? Uh, I like the action a lot, but it didn't work out for them. I'm not married to the result, obviously. Yeah, so we run this action, except I would put a guard at the elbow and call it horn side pistol. Um, uh, now, we made a change to this coverage at halftime, and I don't know if you have the clip in the second half, we defended it great. So this is their four man coming over the top here um, for this first handoff. So we wanted to switch. We wanted to switch here and uh, the four man would go under the handoff and then the, on this, the pistol action, we would switch and ice it with our four and five. So um, I, yeah, to me, it was something that I had questions about, but then we went through it. I saw it and I liked it. And if you, in the second half, we did an unbelievable job and actually forced uh, a travel. As we switched this handoff here and the four-man jumped into an ice, the guy, like, lost his mind and jumped forward and traveled. <laughs> and then the second time, our big man went away too early because he was worried about the roll, and we gave up a layoff. But we kept him on the side in the ice. So it was interesting, but you're – 
you know, we were switching one through four a ton anyways. So why not switch that and ice it with the four and the five? So we would switch one through four and then we would switch four or five sometimes. So if you get beat in the ice, you switch four or five. Um, and they ran this set a lot. One of their go-to plays. So again, this is one of the three or four we walked through before the game. Our foreman was our captain. So he was smart. We, would, we knew he was going to do it correctly. Um, now this was our backup foreman. He did not do it correctly. He didn't keep him iced and our point guard didn't switch. So we had three guys on the ball here and the kick out right. to 34 in the corner should have been wide open, but they don't make the right read. Ariel reads that there's too many guys and he drops and gets a good steal here. So that's more um, talent than coverage in this set. I, I like the way that you ended up playing it. I, I don't believe I have that clip later on and definitely a good read of getting back into the passing lane there for sure. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's why Ariel's going to get drafted in the NBA this year because his instincts are great, you know. Right. Um, this is a an attacking clip. Uh, my question was, is there something that causes you to start using the role replace action at this point in the game? So we're still uh, in the first quarter. I think we're second last. Uh, you, you could have gone two for one here. Your second last play or third last play of the first quarter. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if there was a trigger that caused you to go into the role replace and um, what like what was that trigger if you saw it? So for the clip, for anybody who's listening, uh, the ball gets dribbled, you know, high left slot. It gets skipped to the other side. There's basically a play call. Uh, turns into an, an angled step up in the center of the floor, I guess. Uh, he attacks towards the right sideline and there's the role replace action. The guy who's guarding the guy who pops actually stays down in the paint. Uh, and then it's a skip pass for an open three. So, so, talk so to about it. <laughs> this is a, this is a play that we were running again, Jerry Stackhouse, but it was slightly different. Stack would have cleared out the strong side corner, lifted the four and then exchanged on the weak side. So the goal here was, like I said, we knew they were gonna pull in with the low man. Right. Right. So this is still early. So you see the low man is super loaded up. Yep. Again, Cedric spacing number two, he needs to get to the, I almost cursed there. He needs to get to the corner. He is not in the corner. It's, curse. it's, so, a, it's okay, it's allowed. <laughs> it's, it's a so, coach's show for coaches. It happened, yeah. believe me. <laughs> so we wanted, again, number five who catches it, it was supposed to be a flare and pop out. But he reads that there's no need for the flare. He needs to pop. Right. So he sprints out. It looks like the role we're placing. In reality, it should have been a flare and pop. But if Cedric gets all the way to the corner, he's got a much more wide open shot. But you see, because... Like if we had flared and popped, we would have got the same thing. Number 13 defensively is lost because their low man is so far under the rim, right. taking away the role. Like, well, who do I go to? I've got two here and you're not, like he's not even trying to get out basically at this point. Exactly. So that that was the game plan coming in. If we ran an angle or a mid, exchange on the weak side, drive, kick, swing, like we talked about before the game of how we prepared for this. So this is a great example. Boom, boom, kick it. Now, I would have told Cedric shoot the ball or throw that thing in Ariel who's sealing under the rim. He shoots it. I don't know if we make it or not. I think we hit it, right? Yeah, you make this one, I believe. Right. So to me, we we also, the plan here, and I learned this, you know, coaching against teams who did it to us, put your two best shooters on the same side of the court because it causes a big problem. Who do we rotate to, right? If that right. was number five who's popping here, was a non-shooter and they're they're a good team defensively they don't have to cover him right so put your two best shooters on that side of the court and they got to take one of them one of them is going to be open so that was that was the thought process here let, let me ask you something about that then this is a total aside because i uh, i get mentored by someone and we talk a lot about burn cuts recently and uh i think the consensus in canada tends to be burn your worst shooter among the two and then there's certain coaches that, you know, they have their preferences like, oh, I prefer to burn the 45 on a baseline and I prefer to burn the baseline guy on a, a, a middle drive or whatever. 
if you have your two best shooters on the same side of the floor, do you just basically omit burn cuts totally at that point or? Uh, no. So what we were doing, so let's say the ball came the other way, right? Okay. If it went middle instead of going outside, we would have had Cedric who was high 45 cut, but then get back out to the strong side corner. Okay. So then you're still creating the drive kick swing opportunity for him on that side. Um, we started to get into different things based on how teams were guarding 45 cutting and clearing out the other way. If we knew, like if the team was playing next defense, right. Right. right? Would 45 cut him, clear him out and keep the corner guy in the corner. Cause that's the furthest close out and they can't rotate to that guy because they're so high and they're, they don't know where to go. Basically there's different ways to beat the next. Um, but in this game specifically, yeah, we were flaring, or 45 cutting and getting back strong side corner, no matter what. Like it. Uh, the next clip is, excuse me, the first play of the second quarter. Uh, and then my notes are options and why the choice. So basically uh, the balls, you know, in the local, uh, right in the circle, half court circle, there's a stagger on the right side of the floor, uh, which just basically turns into like an overcut. And then it is a uh, an elevator or a pinch screen on that side of the floor that the stagger was on. Bang, wide open shot for one of your better players. I, you don't end up hitting it, but what were you trying to establish? Why would you go with it here? Uh, how do you feel you executed? Let me know. So I, the, the two bigs should have been tighter to the lane line. Um, for one, they're, they're too high where there's not enough space for him to come through the elevator screen. Uh, right. That was one thing. Uh, he should have gone sooner. You know, I think it's, they, they're, they're like, essentially they should go at the same exact time. Um, and then the reason we ran it was because this is a set we run continue, like you uh, constantly that stagger, Iverson, stagger, whatever you want to call it, right? It's like a side Iverson cut, and we yeah. would run it. We would hit the two-man coming over onto a side ball screen. We keep it in the middle, set a mid ball screen. We'd have the gate action. Um, we run it later in this game for a, a stagger, like 77 action with the guard and the big. Um, so it's a consistent play we're running, and this was just a different read off of it that I knew they hadn't seen because I hadn't run it yet. Um, and it was – we were trying to kind of jump on them, boom, hit another three, just like we did at the end of the first quarter, make it a 12 point game, try and bury them early. That was, that was the thought here. I like um, it. I, I think then, he actually, sorry, David, I think yeah. uh, number five actually does an excellent job of creating separation. Like you said, that the uh, four and the Sprints five. Very well. Yeah. The four and the five don't come together well, but I mean, he's got a few steps on his man for sure. So hey, he's the guy that if you if the play's for him, he's gonna run it right. <laughs> um, he's also the guy that you tell him. I think in this game too, I told him, "Hey, we're running the side out. It's gonna be a flex action. You set the back screen, and then you're coming off the pin down." He forgot everything except I'm coming off the pin down. <laughs> so Those where his shots come from, that's for sure. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then we should have Ariel, the five man, who's the bottom screener we're supposed to flare the four to the corner. So if they get through, it can be a boom, quick swing to the corner. But Ariel forgets the flare and slips to the rim. Okay. I like it. I like the options off of it, as you mentioned. You took the, usually that's my next question. Like, hey, what are the options if the main action doesn't work? But I love yeah, all this Yeah, I mean, stuff we got the doing. shot we wanted for sure. Uh, just didn't hit it. But the screens could have been better. The setups could have been better. Um, again, you know. It happens. You need, you need training camp to do this stuff. Uh, attacking, it's a multiple action set. Uh, I said talk about goals and actions. So, I mean, basically, uh, there's a pin down at the free throw line. The ball gets entered to that left slot. Uh, in, and then a stack, basically, in the, uh, the top of the paint there, just above the nail. It could have been a pin down. It could have been a chin screen. Ends up being a pop by the lower guy. Uh, turns into ball screen action going towards the single side. Your roll comes down the double. And I've seen a few clinics that you've given about manipulating the tag. I think this is a, a good action that places your uh, your top defender here in a tough choice. Uh, it, gets, it gets popped back up top. And this turns into another ball screen going towards 
uh, a single side again, and then you end up with a corner three on that side of the floor. So talk to me about actions and uh, how this fits in with the game plan and what you're trying to do. So um, again, like you watched, we, we talked about how they ran this set where the four man was coming to get the handoff, right? So right. we were calling this horns two because the two the two guards were involved. The two was at the elbow. Um, so this could have been, like you said, a pin down, a back screen. Number five could have curled in. The point guard could have come back to it. They're just kind of playing. I gave them the options here to just play and read. Now, when he comes for the handoff, right, again, our spacing is not great. Our four man who's in the weak side corner is not in the corner. He should have been deeper in the corner to to put them in a tougher spot when number three rolls, um, right. which we knew what their, their defense was. The four man's man pulls into tag as he rolls. You see the low man pulls way over. And if our four man is deeper, we get the kick out swing action, right? So number five makes the read, right? He throws it, okay. We get the swing pass to the top. The roll was really open and it would have been a kick to the corner if the corner man was there. But again, like I said, our fours and fives were kind of interchangeable. Right. So the four runs into a screen instead of the five and the five pops to the strong side corner. And like we talked about, you see right here, if you, if you go back two clicks, um, number 18, when he's in this corner, as the ball is going away, he's setting a flare screen like we drilled um, and yeah. popping out. And then I told you we knew no matter who it was, especially here, that's their five men were attacking in the strong side corner. He's going to pull over. So you're going to have the kick to the weak side off the flare or the strong side corner because they help off strong side as well. So How do you – I'm sorry, David. I'm, I'm curious because the the flare on the the help side of the floor, how do you teach the timing on that relative to when the pick and roll is happening on the other side? Like what's the cue to go and set that when I'm sure everybody knows that a pick and roll is about to happen, but is it first dribble, second dribble, when he looks at it? Like what, what's the cue for him to go? It's really as soon as the big gets up there to set it, that's when you set the flare. Like as soon as he sets it, Right, your your movement is as the ball is coming off of that screen. So that first dribble off the screen, you should be there setting the flare to occupy the tag guy um, and create an opening. So you see, I mean, their coverage is not to go like number 23 here moves off of the flare and tries to get through it. That's not their coverage. So we've already we've already taken them out of what they want to do. Right. There's um, no low man really pulled in basically, and there's there's somebody guessing as to what they're doing. Sure, and then the low man pulls in, kind of, but he goes with the follow behind. And so they're not guarding the pick and roll anymore. They're guarding their man. And now the five's confused because our five is the shooter and he's popping out. Right. Um, so we didn't get the first option, but they kept playing off it and they occupied the guys that we knew needed to be occup occupied to create an open shot. Like it. Uh... Got a few more here. Um, sure. I want to get into a little bit of the end of game stuff. So this was a, a their side out of bounds. It's a top pick and roll towards the double side. I think it's a fairly easy one to talk through. So uh, give me an idea of where the breakdown is for you guys here. So for anybody who's listening, basically it's a pin down and a zip on the strong side. Uh, they skip to the help side guy who blasted up, which looks like they're five. He hands it back to their their guard and then they go just mid pick and roll towards the double side uh and he your your five or your yeah your five engages them on that roll they throw it over the top and get the layup so talk me through it a bit please so our break the breakdown here was so we were we were switching the sideline if you see number five was guarding the the guy taking it out we were switching that to deny the pass into the inbounder right so the two guards as he's coming up in the zipper we switch it which is very typical in Europe. Um, deny the pass, they read it, they flash. This is where we made the halftime adjustment. So this is the lefty point guard that couldn't shoot. So our game plan to start was go under and send him back left. Now, once I realized he really couldn't do anything going to his right hand, we changed that at halftime, or at least we tried to. So what happens is Cedric, number two, should be higher in what we call the wall. Right. Uh, this guy up top, he should be up higher. 
to deter the drive. And our five men would drop. Now, as we changed the game plan up and didn't go over when he came back to his left, so we go under and number five goes over when he goes back to his left. We just started going under everything with this guy to take them out of this drive. So he goes under, gets stuck on the screen. There's no communication and there's no wall to deter the drive. Right. So there's no communication. So our five man is too high. Number five isn't doing anything. They really should have switched this right here. As soon as he got buried, they should have switched. Five should have taken the roller. Our five man should have taken the ball handler and it would have been a late switch. And that's really where the breakdown came in. They both go to the ball handler. They lift the weak side guy. So we have no tag man, right? Which we weren't tagging on the single side anyways. We were trying to wall it up at the top and let the five man drop with, with the roller. So the breakdown comes, the first breakdown is the wall up top. The second breakdown is no communication on the switch in the pick and roll. The, uh, the wall that you're trying to build, number two, you would have him all the way over to the elbow, so to speak. Would that be like his point that he would be looking at? or Higher. I would have him like between the elbow and the three-point line up high. And then our foreman, who's the low man, should be one step up. And he's kind of – we might have to X out. We might have to just stun and get back. But he should have been here. As the ball was coming to the right side, he should have already been up high. And then as the ball's come at, coming at him, he's stunting and moving out with the ball. Right about there type deal? Uh, I'd say even further over. Real, so like inside? Yeah. In like the right there, area. like there, exactly. Yeah. And so he's there early, and as the ball's coming at him, he's moving out, giving the, the defender on the ball time to get back and allowing the five-man to drop with the roller and not be concerned with stopping the ball. Right. We're stopping. We're guarding every pick and roll essentially with three guys when it's up top. Okay. Um, that's where I said it's different. Like where I got it from Germany with John John Patrick in Ludwigsburg, walling up high, and it was very difficult to convince to, to get these guys to do it because everyone's so used to being at the nail rather right. than the three point line. Right. But we got it eventually, but it took time. Um. I've got a transition one here. This is transition defense. They do uh, my my note says drag punch, low side double, and forty five cut. So here is the drag screen. You guys look like you switched that. They punch the ball, so they throw it into the post. Uh, there's a forty five cut on the other side of the floor, which really kind of screws with your help a little bit. And then you guys go to help from the or go to double the post from the low side. And because of that 45 cut, he's just kind of lingering in there, gets the dunk out of it. So first off, I mean, obviously it's a great pass from that punch man, but like, talk me through it. What would you, how would you remedy the weak side more than anything on the double? So if you pause it right here, remember I said we were playing two, three zone. Yeah. I take that back. This is the first game we stopped playing two, three zone and doubles from the low man. Now that's what I had done for the last five or six years. And I knew it worked if we did it right. So we had just started drilling this in practice. So essentially what should happen here is Cedric number two should jump on the high side, force and baseline. The okay. Pass we're gonna give the pass we're gonna give up is this pass back out to the to the point guard who threw it in. Over here, yep. And then we're gonna go with the three-man eye. So 18 here should take 11 at the rim. 22 should drop, and he's got the first pass out. Three is going to take the take the elbow and take the first pass to either of these two guys, and we're going to essentially rotate behind the ball. So that was the game plan. Let me see if I've got this correct. We're, we're there with him. We're on the yep. high side with him. Yep. Uh, three is moving elbow-ish. Yep. And then you, you mentioned drop and take the first. So somewhere in here, I would assume, and then he's got both that closeout yep. and that closeout. So he's got, he's the guy who's got to work. <laughs> yes. The middle guy, the, it's toughest on the middle guy. So 18 should be. Oh, I lost Dave. Still there, Dave. All right. I'm going to pause that for a second until he gets back. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulties. I'll get back into the screen share here for Dave. 
Uh, and Dave, as I said, I had you just right where you had said it's toughest on the top guy there. Right. So, like I said, 18 would take the man at the rim. 22 is going to take that first pass to five or 34 at the top of the key. So if they skip it to five, we're rotating behind the ball. So 22 takes five, number three takes the top, and the guy who trapped in the post takes the point guard. If they skip it to the top, 22 takes the top. 18, who was guarding the guy at the rim, gets back to his man, and we just rotate back to the way we were we were matched up in the in the first place. So you're essentially zoning up, but it's you have two. Two, the three guys on the backside, everyone has two. Love it. And you know you're you've got these two, you've got these two, you've got these two. And uh Chris just had to get out of here and he sings his praises of what a good guest you are. He said he's definitely gonna catch the replay on this one. Uh, I think I have two more clips before end of game. Just being conscientious of your uh, of your time, I'm going to skip ahead to the end of game stuff on here because uh, okay. I obviously want to talk to you about that. Um, there were the two clips that I'm skipping right now. One was just attacking a really, really sunk defense in transition. They were really low on this clip, uh, yeah. giving you a wide open three. And then the next one was a force curl in – uh, a pin down action and second side. I wanted to know if that shot was part of the set scripted. And then there's a third one. I'm wrong. Uh, this, this I actually was... love, I love that play. I love that play. That was the shot we were looking for. And we ran at the game before with uh, Ariel in that spot and got a dunk out of it. Nice. So you, you have the, the pin down on the strong side. Uh, and then on and the we curl, put four man, we put our four man in that corner. Um, cause we knew they'd have to chase him over the top cause he's going to the basket. And Love then it. with the pin down, we knew that they're going to occupy, they're going to, if you pin down over here, they're going to stick with the better shooter. So I know it's a mid range jumper, but that guy is a very good mid range shooter. And we know what shot we're getting here. They have right. to help low man. They have to stay with the shooter on the weak side. We know we're getting in this shot. And like I said, if you watched this Algiris game, the game before we ran the same set, except it was our, uh, number four, Ariel, in that spot instead of 18, and we got a dunk. I, so I love it, and, and I love that you mentioned, you know, the mid-range, and I was going to ask you about shot selection and the value that it is to you and all that, but, uh, I mean, if you're getting it and it's the one that you're after, why not? Uh, this well, it's is funny. They, they asked me in a press conference, hey, you guys shot 33s this game. How come? I said, I'd like to shoot 45 threes. What do you mean, how come? Yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned that there are certain things that are not the same, like in terms of style of play. This is one that uh, I get heavily debated on in Toronto a lot over here about, you know, the shot selection yeah. spectrum. So uh, this one is, if I'm not mistaken, in one of the Raptors 905 staples. This is out of the 70 series. So it's a double drag and then it turns into a stagger on the help side, gives you a shot. Uh, I call it 72. I don't know if I'm mistaken. And then this is uh, attacking with a sideline out of bounds. And I was just, uh, you know, we you fan out and get the ball to the other side. Wanted to see how much of it is to play and how much is actually just good basketball. So question along the same lines, but, you know, great ball movement, hit a big three out of it. And I think- Huge three. Getting, huge pardon three. me, sorry? I said it was a huge three. That yeah. kid, when I got there, they told him, don't shoot threes, you're a four-man. And he became one of our best three-point shooters. That's <laughs> And just to tell you, that is the play, but it's the flex action I've talked about. Right. And their action's out of the flex. So. Love it. Uh, so yeah. bang, bang out of it. And there's the wide open or the the long contested three. And it like was I said, drive, play. kick, swing was the game plan. Kick out, boom, extra pass, three ball. Love it. So now here, here we start getting into more end of game type stuff. So we're late fourth quarter. Uh, this is a defending clip. Uh, you're just under two minutes. This is the late fourth. Are you okay with the shot selection? Is uh, my note, and do you play it the way that you want? So there's an entry, again, uh, like a horn type setup, an entry into that left slot. They give it back. Uh, you guys go under and then switch and then try to go under again. And, but he ends up taking a mid-range jump shot just inside of the three. Do you think that bills you out a little bit? Are you okay with the coverage? Do you do you mind kind of getting buried on this role or could he play it better? You know, you, give me what you see on that. Okay, sorry. My my video is frozen no on problem. that one. So I think 
Do you need me to you stop can... sharing and reshare one time? Let, let me try that for you. Yeah, maybe, maybe. It said told me my video connection is unstable. So sorry. You got that beautiful new facility, man. You gotta have top notch video, uh, top notch internet over there. Come on. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Uh, here, so here we go. Let's let's try it again for you. Entry to that left, uh, you know, like left horn who pops to the three point line. So it's it's left slot touch action, uh, and then goes pin down handoff. So gets into like a Chicago type action, and then he curls that and shoots like a mid range jump shot. Okay, can you try sharing it one more time? Oh, there we go. It just came back. I just switched you to uh, to using my phone. Um, so just rewind. Yeah, perfect. The video is now playing. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. So you get basically you get a Chicago action to the mm -hmm. left side of the floor, pin down handoff, and mm -hmm. you guys get uh, stuck trying to go under on this particular guy. To me, yeah. suggesting that he's probably not a great three point shooter, which is why he steps in and shoots this. Right. So no, that's not how we wanted to guard it, and we got better at this as the as the season went on. So we wanted to switch this cut, this, these split screens on the sides. Mm -hmm. Cedric should have stayed high. Number five should have stayed low like he does. So every time they came together, stay high, stay low. If they curl, continually curl, one guy's high, one guy's low. And we're trying to not let him come back off of this, especially going to his right hand. So the reason we went under it was because he's going right and we wanted to get back to send him back left. But we should have switched it. Cedric, you see, he realizes late he was supposed to be there as the switch man. Right. And so that's why he's late. And also, as I talked about with the wall, this guy, which took time, is too low. He should be up higher, deterring that pass, almost being in this passing lane, like there and moving out as the ball comes to him. Like it. Do you find uh, the FIBA game allows you to uh, bury guys on the roll quite a bit more than uh, North American basketball does? Uh, yes. Simple answer, yes. It also depends on what country you're in. I found that in Lithuania, they let the big guys get away with murder and the guards get called for everything. In Germany, it's like the exact opposite. The guards can play physical as hell in the BBL and the big guys get called for everything. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. There's a fun trait for people to know. So uh, we get into the very end of the game here. So this is their baseline out of bounds. There's 12 seconds left in the game. You guys are up four. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is in ATO play after a weird jump ball call. Uh, so you had a moment to talk with your guys. Yeah. What did you say in the huddle? Are you giving them only the defensive side or are you giving them the offensive side as well? And I mean, obviously this play was not the result you want out of this play. They do end up making this, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, like what's going through your mind in terms of the coverage, what are you going to say uh, afterwards? If you're not, if you are going to call the timeout. So, so sorry, I'll I, run this for anybody who's, who's paying attention. It's, it's a baseline out of bounds. They pop both side. Uh, they reverse the ball and then it turns into like a stagger action on the original strong side that ends up with a wide open three. All you so, did, sorry. No, 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 you're good. So we were supposed to switch everything before and after the ball came in. So right off the bat, number 18 screws it up. He's supposed to take this ball as the ball comes in. Um, then you'll see You'll see they switch, the, the two guards try and switch here. There's a screen, right? They pop out, okay? Then basically what should have happened here is these three guys should have switched out. 22 gets buried on the inside and 34 doesn't switch either. So all across the board, they screw up these switches. It was literally like hand-to-hand -hand switch everything because we know they're trying to get a three. And right. 22 gets buried instead of switching out onto the shooter. Like it, uh, a little bit of a, of acting there. So they they end up getting it. I like twenty two there. I, I like that head bob. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So they they hit it, and then it becomes a one point game with seven seconds left. You choose to take the timeout. Mm -hmm. Um, and then going the other so direction. Our, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this: our play on on the timeout was because 
I hadn't been there long enough to put our get it in play in. Um, our get it in again, took from Nick Nurse. We call it, uh, we just call it line. And it's basically a football play. And you line up like you're on, on the, on the uh, line of scrimmage. And there's a pattern for each guy. Right. And I'm telling you, we used to say this, uh, myself, Jesse Mermis and Nate Mitchell would say that line is undefeated. <laughs> I love it. Undefeated. Love it. it gets it in every single time. I uh, I didn't show that clip, unfortunately, because to me, like it ended up in free throws. You make the two and it comes yeah. the other way. Uh, but with that particular one, would you in that scenario always take the ball in the front court? I know it's an option in FIBA. Uh, would it always be a decision that you're going to make and, and run it? Or is there ever a scenario where let's say it's beyond 14 seconds left where you would take it in the backcourt? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's certain situations I take it in the backcourt. Um, I learned my lesson. We played Ritas and I tried to take it in the backcourt and they pressed and we couldn't get it in. Um, I had the wrong guy taking the ball out. Again, it was the second game I was there. I was learning the personnel. That was a mistake that I learned from. Uh, I think if you have the right play to get it in in the front court, I would almost always do that if you need to score even if you're going on a 14 second shot clock, because if you have to go fast, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, but again, you, know, you remember the Raptors when LeBron took it full court and hit that shot, the fade on the left side. Yeah. And I talked to those guys. When and, Toronto became LeBronto. Right. I remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they talked about that. They didn't anticipate that Cleveland would take it in the backcourt. Yeah. So everything they talked about was front court defense and then they take it in the back court. So sometimes you can throw teams off by doing that. Right. And, and good luck standing in front of a six foot nine man coming downhill full steam at you, right? Full speed. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so as I said, you know, you take it in the front court, you guys made your two free throws line is undefeated. So now it's their ATO again in your uh, defensive half court. Uh, it's, it's an end of game, so you had another huddle where with your guys. And my question was, did you purposely foul up three here? A hundred percent. And he should have fouled number 34 when his back was to the basket. So as soon as the ball comes in bounds here, we were switching. And right, it, right boom, grab him right there. Because now... Put the other guy it, on the line. Cause, yeah, cause and now foul, eight, it could have been three shots. I was just going to say, I was, I'm like, so what are your, your fouling teaching points? Because this foul got borderline dangerous to me. <laughs> yes. And this is where you essentially are coaching a G league team. Cedric Bearfield went to Utah, played one year in OKC in the G league. And this is his first experience in Europe. Ariel Huck Porty is 18 years old. Uh, the kid in the corner, number five is 19 years old. The kid face guarding over here, these are my two veterans that are off the ball, but 22 is 29, and the other guy face guarding in the corner is 24. So we had a very, very young team, and this is a teaching point. We definitely watched this after the fact. You can laugh about it because you win the game. Right. But <laughs> as soon as his back is to the basket, right there, grab him. Grab him before the handoff. Love it. And then and on this, you fell from behind. They award two shots, not three, and he uh, he makes one of two, I believe. You guys get the rebound, and you win the game. And they right. actually went back to look at that play to see if it was an unsportsmanlike because he didn't go, he didn't make a play on the ball. So this we is, could uh, have really gotten screwed there and given him four free throws and the ball. Right. I mean, it was un unbelievable. So yeah. it could have really backfired. That's a, that's a tricky one for sure. Right. Because the, like we, we get called for use a lot at the end of game up here in Canada at the college level. And it's like, it makes it really hard to dictate your end of game strategy, but yeah. I love that you foul up three. I really do because uh, I know some coaches, some even on this call don't do that, but uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much. I'm really happy we got to do this. Yeah, uh, man, I'm sorry was, that, you know, the moving to Lithuania and the and COVID and all that just kind of put a hold on it. But I'm, I'm really happy we got to do it, too. No, this this was excellent. And I've, I've actually learned a lot in this call. I really have. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, you know, for everybody who listens, tunes in, for the coaches that join and listen every week, I really appreciate all of you. I know I say it every week, but it, like, 
it goes out without saying how much it means to me. Uh, you know, we've been really locked down. So this is kind of the highlight of my week. So getting to spend time with guests such as yourself, David, it really means a lot. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'll stop it there if, if you're good. Appreciate you. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys. It was fun going back through the game. Absolutely. Awesome. You know? Uh, hang around for a bit. If you have some time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit afterwards. But thank you and tune in next week to all the Run It Back uh, fans. Appreciate you.